uh, importance of ATR and IPC. We have total 212 registrations today for this webinar. Attendees are only on audio option. Questions can be asked by the participants in the chat box, which is there on the right hand side at the bottom of the screen. A device of laptop or iPad needs to use webinar. So let me have the pleasure to introduce Advocate Rumali Patra, ma'am, for today's session. Uh, Ms. Patra is presently working with DSK Legal as Principal Associate, where she is handling various domestic, domestic and international arbitrations for various government agencies, including SAIL, NTPC, IOCL, and other PSUs. Uh, Ms. Rumali has also specialization in electricity laws and regulations, which enables her to advise generation, distribution, and trading companies in their dispute resolution. Now I would requi request ma'am to take the session and deliver her knowledge to Thank you so much, Radhika, for a very, very warm welcome on a pleasant evening. And it is indeed a pleasure to have been invited by you on such an interesting topic to speak to professionals who uh, are dealing with a subject like IBC day in, day out. Uh, not wasting any further time and uh, digging straight into the topic, I would like to uh, just quickly uh, set out the design of the presentation in the beginning. The topic given for today's webinar was IBC and the dispute resolution processes. Now, at the outset, it seems like uh, the two laws are kind of divorced from each other. There is uh, definitely uh, nothing either in the uh, Insolvency Act code or for that matter in the Arbitration Act, which provides for the dispute resolution process in India, which coincides. So therefore, it'll be interesting to actually unwrap this particular topic in a certain manner and to discuss certain aspects, which to my understanding could be the only merging line between these two areas or these two topics. The first thing that I would like to discuss is the uh, uh, presentation showing on screen. I'm just uh, curious because if it's showing that I've displayed the first slide, which is on legal and regulatory framework. Radhika, can you just confirm if my presentation uh, is visible? It's visible, yeah. it's visible, ma'am. Okay, okay. So uh, the prevalent uh, framework in India uh, is India is actually now moving towards positioning itself in the insolvency and restructuring processes and is actually grappling with the law because we see the number of amendments, the number of interpretations that have come on the IBC are a clear example of the struggle or rather the development that the sector is going through. There has been a rise in both the individual insolvency process and even to some extent the cross-border insolvency processes are picking up in India. The increasing complexity, you know, of the restructuring process or of the, uh, uh, so to say, the uh, insolvency process has actually intrigued a growing interest in, uh, you know, employing ADR processes as uh, separately or in combination with the ongoing court proceedings or the adjudicating authority proceedings. Ma'am. Yes. Uh, sorry for interrupting, ma'am. Your slide is not visible. Mm. So, and is it visible now? Is yes, it visible? Is it visible now? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, the framework, like I was talking about, which is prevalent uh, uh, in India, is that of the acts that I have set out on this particular slide, which comprise of the Recovery of Debt and Bankruptcy Act, which is an old legislation, but it still holds the fort to the extent of situations like the present, wherein uh, there has been you know, a part suspension of the IBC, and therefore the acts like this help uh, uh, come to the rescue of the insolvency process. The Sarfasi Act, the circular that was issued by uh, RBI, the Companies Act, which still provides for schemes of amalgamation and the processes for restructuring of a company. The commercial disputes, which get settled under the Commercial Courts Act or the uh, Act of 2015 and the CPC. Uh, the Negotiable Instruments Act to some extent, because uh, that's an act which also has an interplay in the insolvency. And finally, the IBC. The question that I'm here to actually address and to understand is myself rather, 
is the role that the ADR process plays with all these above stated legislations and how an arbitration process or a mediation process, or for that matter, a conciliation process. So there are three kinds of dispute resolution processes. How these processes have anything at all or would rather aid in any manner the process that has already been provided in a detailed manner in the code that is the IPC. Moving on to the uh, aspect, you know, the before, uh, before actually going further, I just wanted to spend a little time in understanding or in rather setting out the tone of the presentation. That there are two aspects where these two acts have an interplay. The first is with respect to the treatment that an arbitration process gets while an insolvency process is being conducted. So in case where there is an insolvency process which has been started or has been invoked, in that case, what is the role of the arbitration process or how does an arbitration award or claims which are pending or yet to be educated to be treated in that insolvency process? So that is one aspect of looking at these two legislations. The other aspect which is more intriguing and I think helpful for uh, the audience today is that what is the role of ADR, for example, the process of process like mediation in resolving disputes for professionals or resolution professionals and stakeholders? Can this process of mediation be used or for that matter, even arbitration, though I would not want to take it that far because arbitration is a process which is codified and which is legislated and it's it requires certain uh, uh, mandatory uh, essentials to be in place before you invoke it. But what is the sanctity of invoking a mediation process and whether it can come to the rescue of resolution professionals in this entire insolvency process? One of the perspectives on this topic is that this landscape of both the legisla legislations suggests that there is potential for mediation, uh, mediating no, disputes. Yes. I'm really sorry. I'm actually while doing the slide show, your slides are not visible to us. Okay, so I have not moved the slide. I'm still on the same slide. So, uh, um, is it showing now? I've, yes, I'm I'm, showing now. I okay, I haven't changed anything. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, so it's just the same slide. I'm just, just talking about the cursor in between. Going to the standby mode, so that's why it's not visible. Right. Okay. Okay. So uh, basically, the arbitration and conciliation process, like I was saying, the mediation process in the country is such that, you know, it could help resolution professionals to actually uh, uh, have a stress-free, you know, process of res resolving if mediation can come to their rescue. With this, I would like to quickly move on to the second slide, which is the uh, institutional framework. So one is obviously the legislative framework, and then there are institutions which are wanting to aid this particular process. And I'm sure most of us present here today are already aware of these institutions, which are aiding the insolvency process, which is the IBBI, the Agency of Insolvency Professionals, the Insolvency Resolution Professionals, the Information Utilities, the Adjudicating Authorities, which is the NCLT, the NCLAT, the DRT, the DRAT, and of course, the Supreme Court. So this is the entire gamut of the institutional frameworks. But if you look closely, arbitrations or arbitrators are not emphasized as an institutional framework under the IBC. So the process does not require or that does not even contemplate uh, resolving any of these disputes that arise or any of the claims that actually come under the code to be resolved through the arbitration process. And that is why in the beginning, I said they're divorced concepts, but I'm trying to bring them together, marry them into a unison where it could help or assist in uh, taking the law forward. The code, a little time I would like to spend, I've tried to uh, crisply bring in all the salient features of the code. And while I'll be doing this, I will be pointing out the most essential uh, features which could be looked into from the perspective of an ADR process. So digging straight into the salient features on the slide, 
the IBC obviously enables an early resolution of insolvency. So before the company goes into the process, it is a process to enable an early resolution of, you know, before the company reaches that stage. And along with this, though that salient feature will come in later, it is prudent to state right here that uh, in this particular process, the company is treated as if it is, you know, uh, not yet gone into liquidation and it's not to be treated as it's going to wind up. So the company is kept as a going concern, which is, you know, this point on the screen that I've set out here. It, in, it, it The process contemplates that the entity is a going concern. But because it is a going concern, it is obvious that during the process, there is likelihood of more claims that would come in, right? And there is, uh, there is agitation of issues that could happen on the ongoing disputes or on the disputes that were yet to mature and materialize. But because of the moratorium which has been provided under the Act, all those processes are put to a standstill. So how does really arbitration come in? We'll deal with that as we move on. Going to the second part of the salient feature, the process under IBC can be initiated by three categories of creditors, financial, operational, and corporate. The IBC provides for a non-adversarial resolution process. Since this is not a litigation, this is not an adversarial process where one has to win or one has to lose. It is a process where, uh, where creditors and the corporate debtor are working together to restructure or to bring the company back on its feet. It is not an adversarial process. It is not like arbitration or it is not like a process of litigation either. Wherein, you know, the defaulting corporator will be put in a witness box to say that you are wrong or you're right. But at the same time, uh, the the task of the COC and the resolution professional is to come up with a plan to revive and to bring the company back on its feet after resolving all issues that the creditors have raised. Once the committee of creditors is constituted, it is the creditors in control driven process. It's a time bound process for the, uh, 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 it's a time bound process which uh, has been provided under the IPC, including any extension, I think 330 days, including any extension of period of corporate insolvency process, which is to be granted under the IBC. And the time taken in the legal proceeding, you know, which any, any time when a dispute arises with respect to a process or with respect to the fees or with respect to the money that is required for running the process, uh, Professionals end up, or corporate debtors end up going to the NCLT. So the time taken at the tribunal as well is to be accounted for in this particular process that has been set out under the IBC. The IBC contemplates resolution of the corporate debtor as a going concern. I think I've covered this point. Moving on to the next one. IBC envisages cooperation. I would like to really emphasize this point here because it says it envisages cooperation between uh, the promoter of the corporate debtor and imposes penalties and fines on the promoter in case of, in case such uh, corporation is not forthcoming. Now here for a second, we can pause and consider that whether such corporation, if not forthcoming, whether such corporation, if not forthcoming from a promoter could be mediated or could be taken into a dispute resolution process rather than straight away penalizing the conduct or for making it obligatory to comply, having a process to mediate and to resolve it rather than forcing one party to perform in a manner required. So that's a thought process right here that is uh, within the process. If there is a, a stretch or there is some sort of a dispute that arises, it could be taken into a dispute resolution process or a mediation. The interim super priority funding for a day to day operational requirements of the corporate debtor can be raised to prevent value erosion. IBC envisages a collective mechanism of resolution. Now, this is quite interesting because obviously what it provides is that, you know, everyone works in unison in that manner to come with a resolution process. And of course, in the interim, you keep going to NCLT and coming back and, you know, having your disputes resolved. The question is, can and a mediation process or an ADR process be brought in to resolve this process faster, quicker, in a less expensive and in less, less adversarial manner and have it resolved within, you know, through a different process rather than going to the courts. That's, that's a thought because 
it's not something that I've coined or I'm coming up with. As you will see in the slides further, I'm drawing inference from uh, the Singapore and the American uh, law, which provides for such a process and which contemplates that it is indeed idle for having a mediation or a shorter process, which is non-expensive and which is not adversarial to uh, have disputes resolved so that the collective mechanism so contemplated under the IBC could be put to a real, uh, you know, could be really implemented. IBC enables arriving at the best sustainable solution, which is, you know, the scheme of the act. IBC provides for balancing the interest of all stakeholders and maximization of value of the assets of the corporate debtors. So obviously, we know that it's all corporate debtor uh, towards uh, saving the corporate debtor. It's driven towards that, but not at the cost, obviously, of the creditors. There are mechanisms put in place. So this balancing act, obviously, you know, will come with some friction. So that friction process could be taken to a mediation. The minimum amount that is payable to the operational creditors and dissenting financial creditors has already been provided under the IBC. The distinction between uh, financial, operational, secured, and unsecured has also been provided. It's quite clear. The processes are different. The manner in which they can apply is different. The resolution must be in compliance with all applicable laws to the extent possible and not overriding it. It's quite interesting because I'm going to deal with a case where uh, later where the Supreme Court has said that, you know, actually another act can have a, a, a overriding effect on the IBC Act. I'll come to that a little later. A resolution approved by NCLT is binding on all stakeholders, including the central and the state government or local authority to whom the statutory rules are owed. A successful resolution applicant and a corporate debtor cannot be held responsible for offenses committed prior to the insolvency under the management of the erstwhile promoters. Regulator to oversee implementation of law and functioning of the intermediaries such as insolvency professional agencies, IRPs and information utility. Here again, I'd highlight this particular point specifically. Let's move the needle a little. Let's say, let's move it from regulators to saying a mediation process, or let's move it from regulators to saying a dispute resolution process. So instead of having a regulatory body or a, a, an entity to actually dictate what is right and what is wrong and how the guidelines should work, it is possible to then have a mediation process, which also helps the intermediaries work together in a more harmonious and a unison manner. The sale can be above the liquidation value. Malfeasance by erstwhile promoters is scrutinized, uh, scrutinized through forensic audit to enable the clawback of assets of corporate debtor, which fall under the category of preferential, undervalued, fraudulent, or extortion transaction. These are all provisions. I'm just setting out some salient features. Personal guarantees provided for benefit of the corporate debtor can be uh, pursued with effect from December 1. Insolvency against financial service providers can be pursued under IBC. The commencement of such proceedings can be done through an application by the appropriate regulator. The ability to withdraw an insolvency proceeding in accordance with Section 12A of the IBC has also been given. Group insolvency or insolvency of more than one company has been allowed in exceptional cases. The provision of insolvency code now extends to the whole of India pursuant to obviously the omission of earlier order, which was there. Wide notification of uh, March 2020, the government of India has increased the minimum threshold amount of invocation of a CIRP process from one uh, lakh going up to one crore. But there are obviously legal nuances to interpreting this, but not going into that. Very quickly before, so I think in the last three slides that, that I had gone through, while setting out the salient features of, uh, I, of the court, the idea also was to dwell into the aspects where uh, in the process or in the salient features, the process of ADR could be brought in. This is the status that has been taken as of December 31st, just to give a very fair idea because, you know, the numbers are growing, which means obviously the number of uh, disputes that arise in the process also obviously are going to enlarge with complex insolvency processes involving, you know, international uh, uh, companies as well. 
it is likely to get more complex and therefore processes like mediation in ADR can help resolve it better. So this just gives a very realistic picture of uh, this data is of 2019 though. The information that, you know, that's available is that the CIRPs at the end of the quarter almost, if you could see in October, December was increasing, not even by proportion of one or 2%, but almost by 100%. So that's the kind of jump, and that's why I said in the beginning, it's a growing process. So we need to have further processes merge into this particular CIRB process to make it more convenient, efficient, and cost-effective. I think I've already covered this part, but why I set it out here is because in the next slide, I'm just setting out which category of uh, you know creditors go most often. And this is very interesting because I'm going to deal only with operational creditors when I talk about arbitration in the second half. So there are three categories, as we all know, that there are three categories of, uh, I'm just going back to the like last slide, applicants who can you know invoke the IBC process. There are financial, operational, and corporate applicants. Now, of these applicants, you will see the operational creditors are the ones who make the maximum application, right? Because they are the ones who want, you know, who invoke the process under uh, section eight of the court. And we will deal with that a little later to show that how most of these operational creditors claims actually get adjudicated and not get adjudicated, adjudicated upon. The resolution process, I think uh, considering I'm already talking to a bunch of uh, professionals, I understand and appreciate that the process is already known. I just like to spend some time on it before I go to the final uh, tranche of this, which is on arbitration. The process has been set out in two phases. Uh, it's basically a process which consists of uh, that's you know a time bound process. So there are three phases, but each phase has been looked at from three different aspects. That is for financial creditors, for operational creditors, and for corporate applicants. For financial creditors, there is a filings, filing of an application, which is what they have to do immediately on the occurrence of a default in payment. Based on the information that is there with the information utility, the other financial creditors may also file. It's like a cross trigger. So if there's a trigger under one financial creditors, if a loan has been defaulted on, on one particular borrower, the others also, the other lenders could also cross trigger and they can file applications. Along with the application, they are mandated to furnish record of the default and to propose the name of the interim resolution professional. Then, you know, the whole exercise starts where the NCLT sits and observes that whether, you know, the uh, whether the uh, resolution professional proposed, is there any sort of, uh, you know, case or litigation going on? Are they qualified? At the same time, uh, are all the documents or evidence that is required to meet a default has been provided, right? So the second part, which you see on the slide, that, you know, what happens uh, within 14 days from this process to here, is common for all the three, but how the approach obviously is different, right? Moving on to the operational creditors, which is the second column, so to say. This starts with delivery of a default notice from a, from the uh, operational creditor to the corporate debtor, wherein they say that, look here, this payment is due and you have to make this payment. So that default notice is important from one entity to the other. Within 10 days of receiving of that notice, a reply has to be sent back by the corporate debtor to the operational creditor, either acknowledging the debt or disputing the debt. It is also possible that, uh, so obviously when the operational uh, creditor receives that reply, makes an application, and while making that application, it is uh, important that he annexes all uh, particulars of uh, the default in payment, again, similar to the first process, and brings in evidence that this payment that he says is in default is not being paid, you know, bank statements, et cetera. Therefore, you know, encashment of checks and even uh, the negotiable instrument acts become relevant here. So that's the second part of the process. I've set it out. It says if there is adequate reply, if there is not adequate reply, if there is adequate reply, it could be settlement of dispute, uh, dues, or it could say that, look here, if the adequate reply is there is a dispute ongoing on this particular amount. And I would like to deal with this part of it when I move to the second part, which is arbitration, that when an operational creditor receives a reply stating that there is a dispute which is ongoing and therefore on the amount that you're claiming and therefore this amount is not paid. When the reply is not adequate, obviously an application is filed. And again, within the same process of uh, 14 days, if accepted or not accepted, 
we move to phase two in case it is accepted and that I'll come to in the next slide. If it is not accepted, they have to reapply within seven days and otherwise it gets rejected. So this is the process, so to say, after 14 days. Going to the third category, which was corporate applicants. Uh, filing of uh, an application obviously again occurs on a, a, a event of occurrence of a default and the similar process. So what we see is that obviously for a corporate applicant and for a financial credit, the process seems more aligned as opposed to that of an operational credit. Moving to phase two of this process, which is um, yes, sorry, I think I skipped a slide. So. Moving to phase two, which is the entire process has to be completed within a period of 180 days, which is extendable by 90 days. Um, I've just set out the timelines of the whole process, which is, you know, there is an order of admission, which is the uh, commencement date, so to say, of the process. And post that, there is declaration of the moratorium period and all pending claims that are there prior to making of this particular, uh, you know, application which comes under section 14, that once the process starts, there is a moratorium period which kicks in. Uh, there's a public announcement uh, under the order of NCLT and the appointment of the interim resolution professional. These are the four things that happen right in the beginning, you know, once it's uh, accepted. Now, within 30 days of that, the interim resolution professional is to appoint a committee of creditors and to do all such duties, which are obviously set out in the court, you know, appointment of the, uh, setting out the plan, et cetera, making a draft, taking all the claims, et cetera, forms that have that come. The first meeting of the committee of creditors is to have within seven days of their appointment. And after the appointment of the resolution professional by a majority vote and communication to NCLT for confirmation of the vote. The resolution professional to conduct the corporate insolvency process, they will, the committee of creditors shall hold meetings as necessary and the preparation of the information memorandum. Then there is some in submission of the resolution plan uh, by the resolution applicants to the resolution professional on the basis of information memorandum. And obviously there is examination of that whole plan which is submitted then. There is approval of that resolution plan by the committee of creditors and then followed by the order of the NCLT. The moratorium order comes to an end uh, uh, after this order of the NCLT and the resolution uh, professional to forward all records to the board, which is the IPPI. So this is the process in second phase. And it's, it's like I said, it's a time bound process. So this runs in this manner. Now, uh, quickly going to the second part of the presentation, which, you know, knowing, having dealt with a little on the salient features, touched a little upon uh, how in those features it is possible to have or to contemplate a possibility of mediation and arbitration. But also having said that they are completely divorced concepts, I would now like to take this uh, leap into the subject, which is the arbitration award and the meaning of a dispute under the IBC. So if I can quickly go back and come back to this particular point where I spoke about a dispute, which was being pointed out by the operational, uh, by the corporate debtor to the operational creditor that look here, you made a claim, you've said that there is amount due to you, but I, dis I say that there is a dispute on this amount and therefore this amount is not payable. So I would like to quickly come to the fact that in one of the decisions, now I'm going to talk about a very specific judgment. There are the two judgments that are very particular here, very peculiar here to the subject. In the case of uh, Mobilox Innovations Private Limited versus Curiosa Software Private Limited, which is also on the screen, the Supreme Court went into analyzing the question that whether when an arbitration award is issued, right, in finality, obviously, between the parties, decides a claim in favor of one particular person. However, the other uh, party to the award disputes that particular uh, uh, award and files a section 34 appeal, right? Then whether this particular award has attained any finality, right? That's obviously a question under the Arbitration Act. When you challenge the award, it has not attained finality. So what purpose does this arbitration award serve for the IBC process? Is it a claim in finality? Is it a claim to be merely acknowledged or not to be acknowledged at all? And what happens if this claim, you know, of the arbitration award is brought in by an operational creditor 
and what happens when it is brought in by a financial uh, creditor. So very quickly, before I go into the exact, uh, uh, you know, the issue, the answer that was set out by the Supreme Court, which is also on the screen, very clearly saying, I'll just quickly go through this first, then I'll deal with the issue. The section 34, when filed on an arbitration award, is a pending dispute for the claimed amount. The first question is, what if there is a delay in filing of that appeal? You know, the section 34 has to be filed under the Arbitration Act within 90 days of an arbitration award. So when the operational creditor comes with an arbitration award, but there is a delay in filing of uh, any appeal, then what happens to the whole award? Will it be admitted or not admitted in the IBC proceeding? This particular judgment says that limitation also, irrespective of limitation also, since there is a dispute on whether post limitation as well, this award was admissible or not, or was challenged or not, it will be considered as a dispute between the parties. So the question of limitation was answered in affirmative saying that if an arbitral award is challenged beyond limitation, then the IBC professionals are, you know, they are the, the, uh, the insolvency process will consider this arbitral award to be a part of the claim. The second aspect of this is, I have been given an award in my favor. Okay, let's assume I've given, been given an award in my favor, but the other side challenges that award and also says that, look here, I had some counterclaims in my arbitration award, which have not been awarded to me. And my counterclaims value is higher, way higher than what I have been awarded. So there is a set off that needs to be done. So in that case, when I initiate the IBC process as an operational creditor and I issue a notice of default, the court says that because there is a counterclaim standing of a higher value, plus because the uh, corporate debtor has disputed that arbitration award in my favor under Section 34, it will not be considered as a amount in default and rather be a dispute between the parties, so this amount becomes inadmissible. The question that the Supreme Court does not answer is, what if there is no counterclaim at all? In this particular case, and in the case after, which was in 2018, I will refer to that as well and show some relevant paragraphs. In the case after, in both the cases, there were counterclaims between parties. You know, both the parties had claims against each other. But in a case where there was there is no counterclaim between parties, the court has not contemplated what happens. So, for instance, if there is a, a, a there's an award in my favor, and there was no counterclaim at all from the other side, and I have an award in my favor, but the other side has challenged it. In that scenario, the court merely says address question number three, which is on the screen. So you have to only assess whether there is even existence of a dispute between the parties or the records of pendency of a suit or arbitration proceeding filed before the receipt of the demand notice of the unpaid operational debt in relation to the dispute. So if there is a dispute between the parties or there is a record of a pending arbitration proceeding which has been filed, you know, before the file, before the demand of the unpaid amount in relation to the same dispute, then in that case, it would not be possible to consider that particular amount as an amount in default because you know parties are at dispute, they're at loggerheads, obviously the claim's not final. Rather, the court goes one step further. They say not only 34, even 37. So that's an appeal from 34 under the Arbitration Act. So if there is a award, it goes in 34 and then it goes in 37, so which is a second appeal. So in case of a second appeal also, the court says it will still be considered in dispute and it will not attain finality. However, that becomes an antithesis to the very concept that the arbitral award attains finality, at least between the parties. And the IBC doesn't provide for anything in terms of, you know, an award being final or not being final. But it does say the factum of a dispute, the existence, whether good, bad, ugly, the existence of a dispute is essential. At the same time, if the dispute is fraudulent or vexatious, you know, you're doing it only out of malified intentions, that look here, they also owe me something or, you know, this claim has been uh, uh, not adjudicated properly. You know, it, it seems like on the face of it that 
there is actually no claim by the uh, corporate debtor and they're just trying to create a dispute. In that case, the uh, uh, NCLT will have the power to look into it and to allow it that particular arbitration award to go ahead as a default, as a notice of default. So those are the aspects which this particular court considered while looking into an arbitration award and how a dispute has to be looked into. So I would just read the first two questions as well, which is obviously whether there is, because this particular case was only on operational uh, debt. I would like to quickly go through some parts of the judgment, which was uh, decided by the Supreme Court. I'd like to display it on my screen so that uh, the essential parts of that particular judgment uh, so uh, I, is my is my screen visible? I'm just I'm sharing a judgment on my screen. I don't is it showing? Can you please confirm for me? Uh, no, ma'am. One second, please. Uh, I'll stop sharing the PPT and then share my screen with the judgment. Now is it showing? Uh, yes. Okay, so this is a judgment of 2018 where the Supreme Court is referring back to its judgment, which I just showed on the presentation. I just wanted to read through some parts of this because this is exactly how the court deals with this particular situation. So while referring to the legislative history in Mobilox, which is the case we referred to, the court appreciated that one thing, one of the things that the legislative guides spoke about was whether the debt is subject of a legitimate dispute or set off in an amount equal to or greater than the amount of the debt. It is very essential. So one is set off and the other is a legitimate dispute. Can you set it off completely? So you resolve it, you settle it. The other is if it's a legitimate dispute at all, or if it is not. Another thing spoken was the improper use of insolvency process would occur in cases where a creditor uses insolvency as an inappropriate substitute for debt enforcement procedures even though they may not be well developed. So under the Arbitration Act, an arbitration award can be enforced as per provisions of the Act. For enforcement of the award, a party can file an enforcement application, have the property of the uh, entity which is entitled to make the payment attached, have the bank accounts attached and you know, uh, enforce the award and take that money. At the same time, the intention which is being set out here is not to use the insolvency process as an enforcement process. So, you know, that overlap is being cleared that this is only for insolvency processes, which is trying to save the company. And this is only for enforcement of the award. So that that, that categorical distinction must be maintained. So this becomes very relevant for understanding the distinction between the two acts. Quickly going through. Uh, the important sentence of these notes, as it was stated, was this ensures that operational creditors whose debt claims are usually uh, smaller are not able to put the corporate debtor into insolvency resolution process prematurely or initiate the process for extraneous consideration. You know, you have rivalry and you want to initiate an insolvency process. And obviously, once initiated, it triggers the whole, you know, all the creditors coming in. So therefore, uh, it sets out that it should not be abused. The process should not be abused by operational creditors. And like I showed you in the earlier slide, maximum insolvency processes, at least till December 2019, were initiated by operational creditors. This court has also noticed, this is very important to note, that the original bill, which was, you know, which ultimately became the court, had the expression bona fide dispute. And that's why the whole discussion on a legitimate dispute between parties and not merely a puffed up one, uh, is was contained in the inclusive definition. It is significant to note that at the time when the court was enacted, the ex expression bona fide was dropped. Now, what does this mean? Irrespective, whether it's a bona fide dispute or it is not a bona fide dispute, it is actually correct or not correct, is not the job of an entity or the NCLT while sitting and looking at the default notice, whether it was the dispute being raised by the other side on the claim being made is good. No, no, it doesn't look meritorious. It looks fraudulent. That is not the exercise that they will do anymore because the word bona fide was taken away. 
the exercise contemplated is the existence of a dispute. And when there is an existence of a dispute, that would mark the very fact that this process, this insolvency process cannot be initiated because it would then be, you know, rejected by the NCLT under the provisions of Section 8. After uh, referring to Section 8, the judgment, which is Moby Locks, which is what we are, uh, you know, referring to, went on to hold that it is important that the existence of the dispute and or, you know, a suit or an arbitration proceeding must be pre-existing. It should not start after the process has been initiated because obviously there is moratorium and all such processes are put to a halt. It must exist before the receipt of demand notice or invoice as the case may be. So this is the paragraphs that I had set out on the slide, which are the three things which one must look into and the third one being most essential. If any one of the aforesaid conditions is lacking, the application would have to be rejected. Apart from the above, the adjudication, adjudicating authority must follow the mandates of Section 9 as outlined above, in particular, mandate of 9.5 of the Act and admit or reject an application as the case may be, depending on the factors mentioned in 9.5. So these are provisions of the Act, which have also been quoted in this judgment. So which basically say that if they do not meet the factor of there being, an, uh, there being no dispute at all, then of course the process will be admitted. If there is an existing factor of an existing dispute, the process has to be rejected. In para 38 of Mobilog, it says we have seen from the from seen that one of the objects of the code qua operational creditors is to ensure that the amount of such debts, which is usually smaller than that of financial debt, does not enable the operational creditor to put the corporate debtor, you know, prematurely and initiate the process for in extraneous consideration. It is for this reason that it is enough that a dispute exists between parties. So what are we really discussing is the factum of a section 34 that is a challenge to an arbitration award is also to be considered as a dispute between parties, right? Though obviously it's not yet concluded, there is no stay on the award that I hold, but it is to be considered as a dispute and the IBC process cannot come in. So the role of uh, overriding all existing laws, the provision which says that, you know, it will have an overriding uh, impact on all the existing laws under the IBC cannot take precedent precedence in this particular situation. So following this judgment, it becomes clear that the operational creditors cannot use the insolvency code either prematurely or for considerations or, or as a substitute for debt enforcement procedures. The alarming result of an operational debt contained in an arbitral award for a small amount to say 2 lakh rupees cannot possibly jeopardize any other solvent company worth several of several crore of rupees. So therefore, uh, such a case would clearly come within the para 38, which are the three conditions, that's para 38 of Mobilox, being a case of a pre-existing ongoing dispute between parties. So in this case as well, like in the other case, the situation was that there was a dispute between parties, there was an arbitration award, and that arbitration award was challenged. Quickly going back to the presentation, So uh, this was this was the case of Mobilox, which becomes relevant for discussion on arbitration in IPC. Another interesting claim is, uh, sorry, another interesting case is that in the case of Transmission Corporation of Andhra Pradesh versus Equipment Conductors, the Supreme Court held that the code is not for recovery. I think that was also reestablished in some sense uh, by the Supreme Court, also in the case of Mobilox, which says if the claim is a disputed one, then we can, there cannot be a CIRP process. In the case of Naveen Luthra versus Belf Invest, the adjudicating authority, being not a court of law and as an adjudicating authority, do not decide a money claim or suit. So if a disputed amount or a disputed claim has come to them, they will not sit and decide on whether the claim or the money in amount, how much of it rather, or how much not of it. So they will not even do that setting off or they will not even do the uh, higher value or the lesser value of counterclaims or a higher value of claims of the arbitration award. They, will, they, they cannot go into that whole process. As initiation of the CIRP under, the seven, under Section 7 and 9 do not amount to recovery proceedings. Ki isme se how much amount actually you can recover or you cannot recover, right? 
So the question of deciding the claim, which may include the uh, interest of the uh, which uh, which may include the interest by the adjudicated authority, does not arise for the purpose of triggering a CIRP process. In the case of Edelvi's asset reconstruction versus Synergy's Dore, the resolution plan can provide for a, a merger or consolidation of the CD with one corporate debtor with one or more person in terms of the CIRP process. The INB code, so this is why am I wanting to show this particular judgment is that the INB code is a complete code by itself. And section 238 provides for overriding effect of it over the provisions of other acts. So they're very essential because that the NCLAT says that the IBC has an overriding effect on all the other acts. So therefore, the uh, the interpretation or the provisions of the Arbitration Act will obviously be overridden in terms of if, you know, this particular provision. But the interesting part is if any of the provisions of this of an act is in conflict with the provisions of the INBA code. Now, because the IBC does not provide for uh, any overriding effect or any provision which is in conflict of the Arbitration Act, there is a harmonious interpretation which is given to both the acts to suggest that yes, the IBC process, you know, while referring to dispute, will consider the interpretation that has been provided for under the Arbitration Act to conclude whether the award under challenge is in dispute or otherwise. Mediation. Coming to the last part of this uh, presentation, which is uh, introducing uh, the process of mediation and whether how feasible or how not feasible this is. So mediation, just to explain a little, is a very flexible process. It is not an adjudicatory process in that form. Mediation is more of a, a process where, uh, where a particular person is appointed to consider uh, issues raised by both the sides or by one side against the other. And while considering those issues, is allowed to give various proposals to resolve that dispute and not to give a verdict to say X, Y, Z, and you both are bound by it. It's a process where the mediator helps bring in both the parties on common ground, let go certain uh, issues and accept certain uh, uh, issues which are either problematic for either of the parties and makes them rather. So it's basically someone making them negotiate to come to a common ground. Having said that, it's a process which can be inbuilt in the process of IP, in the process of resolution, at a stage where there are uh, disputes arising between the stakeholders or between the promoters and the us by promoters and the corporate debtor or the insolvency professionals, and this process will uh, is obviously not and since it's not an adjudicatory process, it would not be uh, there is there would not be any going to the court. There'll be reduction on the court uh, payments of fees, uh, you know, all the cost that is attached to it also the time that it consumes. So in a sense, it's a process which can actually be fed into the uh, resolution process with respect to disputes inter se between the stakeholders of that process. So mediation is a flexible process, like the slide also says, in which a neutral mediator facilitates the parties to a settlement negotiation to help them reach their own solutions. Focus of mediation is finding a solution that will resolve the party's concern. Mediators make no decision con concerning the concerning which the party is at fault in a dispute. So in a mediation process, you will never have a verdict which will say, OK, X, Y, Z was wrong. So therefore, ABC and therefore the other side was wrong on so and so ground. There's no finding of a right or wrong. It is a process of solution oriented. It only records proposals how from an X proposal, it went on to X minus one or things like that. And it finally came to a, a process or a solution which was acceptable to both. So it's a recording of solutions and proposal. So for example, uh, this thought that, uh, uh, that has been put out in the slide and is being discussed today is a uh, borrowed thought from uh, the Committee of uh, Strength in Singapore as an international center for debt reconstruction which issued a report suggesting that mediation can be used effectively in restructuring proceedings, right? To either resolve individual creditor dispute with a debtor, right? In case of a multi-creditor restructuring, manage multiple creditor disputes of the same nature. So for example, if there are multiple creditors and within the COC, if there are disputes or if there are issues which, could, which need to be resolved, a mediation process could be helpful. 
managing multiple uh, achieving consensus in the restructuring uh, plan between a debtor and its creditor so obviously there is uh, coming up with a plan like i said everyone has to work in unison and give a uh, give a plan which is approved to avoid those disputes mediation process could be brought in so this is all and uh, i wanted to also add before uh, just concluding the last part of it that even the american american process of insolvency envisages the mediation process there are proposals floating around it the uh, it's not yet there in india and uh, there is no thought to it but at the same time it is something that could be looked into to have a better process and a faster and a quicker process to resolve disputes during the uh, insolvency process so with that i would uh, like to conclude my presentation and uh, keep some time for uh, questions if there are any and i will quickly uh, go to the q and a section uh, to see if there are any questions for me okay um, there are questions from mr ravi chandran yes please yeah, uh, one the CD has accepted part of the supplies and disputes are the part whether the OC can file an application in NCLT for the amount accepted by CD. So, um, so this is basic. I think this is a very specific question on the IBC part, where obviously it says where there is a part acceptance and uh, there is a dispute on the other part. So that the part that is accepted. Right. So with the part with the amount, the claim that is uh, accepted by uh, the corporate debtor. Is the part for which a resolution process could be initiated, provided there is no dispute on the entire award. Let me rephrase this in the mobile ops case. This was the exact situation. There were three claims made by the operational creditor and the operational creditor took all those three claims to arbitration. Two were allowed, one was rejected. Out of the two claims allowed, one of the claims was accepted by the corporate debtor to say, yes, this is payable. And I, I understand this amount is payable, but I'm disputing the other amount. Now, that particular arbitration award also had some counterclaims from the corporate debtor, saying that I also, you know, I'm entitled to certain payment. The court said that if there is an existence of a dispute on that particular amount, while analyzing the order, even though the CD has accepted it, and that's a fact recorded in the order of the Supreme Court, that even if there is an acceptance of that particular part of the uh, part of the claim, which is adjudicated, but because the award is under challenge under Section 34, right? So in a situation where the award is under challenge under 34, it will be a factum of a dispute, and therefore that will not be admissible, and there could not be a CIRP proceeding. However, in a case where there is no 34, in a case where there is no 34, an amount which is not disputed will be placed in the factum of a contingent liability by this particular entity, right? By the, uh, by the cop, uh, for the corporate debtors process, it will be captured as being a contingent liability and then accounted it, accounted it for by process, whatever payments are to be made, et cetera. Like it, ha it has happened so in other resolution processes of SR, et cetera. So I'm, I hope I've been able to answer that question. I can take the second question. Um, second one, can an he go for arbitration and simultaneously send demand notice under IBC? So uh, that's exactly the point which I think I dealt with. And thank you for asking that question. So because IBC is not a process for enforcement, the fact that you're going for an enforcement under the Arbitration Act, it shows that you want to enforce the award and you cannot then use the IBC process. There is a principle or there's a doctrine in law which says forum shopping. So you cannot do forum shopping. You cannot use all forums to keep invoking claims. If it is enforcement of an award, it has to go to the uh, under the Arbitration Act. But if you come to the IBC and it is found frivolent and you it is taken as a mechanism of enforcement, then also it will have to be rejected. But forum shopping is not you know, it is, a, it is a legal principle which parties are not allowed to do. So that's about it. Is there any other question that I can take? Um, we can take two more questions. Please. One is, uh, what do you think of the feasibility of a mandatory 
dispute resolution for a period of 90 days prior to commencement of COC. Okay. Um, well, that's a proposal. So if so, I want to. So, I, I, is the question on screen? Uh, is this it's on the chat screen actually? Uh, chat is, is this is this Bhavin who has asked this question? No, no ma'am, it's uh, Mr. Anil. It's on the chat window actually. One second. I I just wanted to. Can you read? Can you say the question again? Because I wanted to understand okay. which phase are they talking about the arbitration okay, process. Can you repeat? Uh, it's what do you think of the feasibility of mandatory dispute resolution? For a period of 90 days prior to the commencement of COC, the IRP can represent the creditors in mediation or conciliation. Yes, so that's the so that's that's the proposal because it's it seems like a feasible proposal considering both the uh, Singapore and the American uh, um, you know uh, uh, resolution processes are following it. But they do not specify it before the appointment of, you know, immediately after and before the first meeting of the COC. It is only at a time when there is an, a, a dispute or an issue which can't be resolved. I believe it could be put in. But at the same time, 90 days, I'm not sure, because it's a process which has to be a, in a time bound manner. So that period inclusion, I'm not sure of the proposal. But yes, the mediation process could definitely be introduced. It could be considered. Uh, next one, will inclusion of ADR make resolution process time bound? Um, so a, when I say ADR, I'm talking about mediation. And yes, because in the process of process contemplated under the IBC, the period includes the time that one takes to going to the tribunal and coming back. So in that process, instead of going to the tribunal, I'm suggesting that one goes into mediation. So it would take care of that. And last one from Mr. Bhavin Agarwal. Where the CIRP has stated and the operational creditor has agreed to out of court settlement, and the promoter of CD is ready to do the OTS with the FC, how mm -hmm. can a mediation be introduced where the RP is not agreeing to this alternative? So uh, you're right, of course, when there is a then there is already a settlement that has started, then I believe that the process is, the process does not continue in the same manner and in the same rigor on the same phases as contemplated under the IPC, right? Has agreed to, they have agreed to an out of court settlement, and um, in that case, obviously the mediation process cannot be introduced and would not be introduced because the RP wouldn't agree to this particular alternative. Is there any other question that I can take? Um, I think uh, questions are done from the participants end. Okay, okay. Uh, so I would uh, like to thank everyone for uh, you know attending and listening to me. And uh, thank you so much, Radhika, for this particular opportunity. And uh, thank you to the organization as well for inviting me. It was my pleasure to learn and to also uh, read up on this particular aspect a little more. Uh, knowing that arbitration and IBC are divorced, it was interesting to bring both the topics together. I'd be happy to take any questions offline if required, and I will share my presentation with the organization for everyone's benefit. Well, thank you so much ma for your time and your patience for sharing your points over the importance of ADR and also uh, face by face like of the CIA process as well. Thank you so much ma for your time. And thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Good thank evening. You,